Tranquility Grove um, is a book about a particular moment in time, uh, the largest abolitionist picnic that was ever held, uh, and it was held here in Hingham in 1844. How did this come to pass? Well, first of all, I want to introduce you to some of Hingham's open spaces and properties of which this particular grove is one. This is a map of Hingham's 77 public parklands. About a third of the town is an open space. And of these 77 parklands, about 33 are under the sort of management and control of the um, Hing uh, Hingham Conservation Commission. And the one place we're talking about, right up, right up here, number 38, which is now known as between Central and Hersey Streets, now known as Burns Memorial Park. Now, several years ago, our town historian, Alec McMillan, who is here sitting in the back, approached me about the possibility of doing some research into this property. Tranquility Grove originally had been one of many groves in the town that people used to walk to in midnight walks or have picnics or church lunches or different events. And this is really the last one, I think, except possibly for World's End, um, that we have in town today. There was one uh, um, down on Water Street. There was one up in South Hingham. They were all over the place, and Tranquility Grove was perhaps the best one of these. But what we see today at number 38, one of the Conservation Commission properties, is this entrance, which is a very sort of abandoned site. You can see Burns Memorial Park, little sign here. Mm -hmm. The entrance is quite narrow. It's just across Hersey Street from the old DPW headquarters. And um, you can walk in there, but it's better to do it this time of year before the, all the brushes has um, become overgrown. But in any, any case, Alec had heard that there was a big event that had taken place here um, before the Civil War, but he wanted to look into the property and to find out where it had come from and, and where, it had, where it had been. So I started off when he handed me a great pile of deeds and went down to the Registry of Deeds in Plymouth to look up the background of the property and sure enough found uh, records going back to the early 1600s when Hingham was laid out with long properties that were used for farming. And these were residual. This was an open space, as it was shown before the construction of Central Street and Elm Street. But you can see the general location. And for the purpose of this event, we're going to talk about um, an area right about here that was part of the walkway up to Tranquility Grove. One of the owners of, of the property um, who purchased it from one of the Thaxter brothers who they owned the property at the time was Charles Siders. And eventually his estate sold the property to the Burns family. And there it, lay, there it stayed for many, many years. And it was used as a dump and sort of a forgotten area until it was eventually purchased by the town in a complicated arrangement. But when I started working down at uh, the Registry of Deeds, I also started looking on Google and looking into records here at the library and records at the Historical Society. And it was just unbelievable what sort of poured off of the shelves. For those of us who grow, who've grown up here in the South Shore, and I grew up in Quincy and lived in the summers in Plymouth and then have been here for 42 years, we are used to the founding myths, you know, the Pilgrims, the Puritans, Thomas Morton over in Quincy, or the folks in Wessagusset. Um, and then we're also sort of familiar with the Revolutionary War history. But we just don't know much about this abolitionist pre-Civil War period at all. So the first thing I found out was that the event that took place at Tranquility Grove, of which there are now only these 25 acres remaining, but that it was a celebration of the 10th anniversary of the freeing or the emancipation of the slaves in the British West Indies. This actually happened in 1833, and it was announced to the slaves of the British West Indies a year later in 1834. And there were very dramatic um, visuals of representing that particular point in time. And what happened at that time is that the abolitionists who were already active 
decided to adopt the celebration of the freeing of the slaves as an event that would be commemorated every year. To them, it was far more important than the 4th of July. And uh, so let's talk about that a little bit. Now, prior to 1833, people wonder, what, what was the story about slavery in Massachusetts? And there were slaves in Massachusetts, and slavery began back in the 1600s. And there's record of about 70 slaves in Hingham prior to uh, the, the latter part of the 1700s. Um, a recent book has been written, and somebody here may know the author, and I've not run into it myself, about slaves in Situate and Norwell, but I'd love to get the information about that author later. But what was interesting is that the, the Chief Justice of Massachusetts in 1783 was William Cushing, and you know how we call Route 3A Chief Justice Cushing Highway. That's, our, that's the Chief Justice. He was descended from the Cushings of Hingham, but lived down in Situate. And he came to a decision on a case called the Quack Walker case. Quack Walker was a slave who had been freed by a legacy, but then re-enslaved and fought, fought the, um, uh, his situation. And his lawyer was a Levi Lincoln, who was descended from the Lincolns of Hingham even though this was a Worcester case. But in any case, Chief Justice Cushing in 1783 said that slavery is inconsistent, incompatible with our constitution that we've recently passed. And so for all intents and purposes, slavery came to an end in Massachusetts at that time. It took a while to settle things out and there was still segregation, but this was a very, very significant case. Now, we talk about the people who were involved with this particular picnic in 1844, the 10th anniversary of the freeing of the emancipation of the slaves in the British West Indies. William Lloyd Garrison was sort of the great son around whom everybody gathered um, in the abolitionist movement. There was a Boston group um, and he had correspondence. They put on picnics and fairs and lectures and they were all over. They had, he, he created his newspaper, which I mentioned here, The Liberator in 1831. And there was another newspaper, sister paper down in New York that I'll speak more about. But what was significant about The Liberator is that it had every detail about the event on that day in August 2nd, 1844. So you can go back, you could look at it either here in Hingham at the library or online and there was complete description from the initial publicity to food people should bring to the, um, the procession and what people carried and who was leading the procession. It was just an extraordinary event. So Garrison and his abolitionist allies were the organizers of this particular event. Another thing that came as a great surprise immediately was something that actually is a Weymouth piece of art it's supposed to be one of the 25 best pieces of folk art in the United States. Mm -hmm. This was created by a young woman, Susan Torrey Merritt from Weymouth. And I have heard she was about 22 at the time. Would you say that was her age? There were, she was very, very young. And this is all that anybody knows of the work that she's done. It's a collage. But it was a perfect illustration for Tranquility Grove Picnic because we read about the description of the tables, the hills, the people, and they're dressed in their best. And uh, apparently people don't know exactly the date, although it is dated 1845. But this took place uh, in the former Weston property, where the Tufts Library is located about there today. And there's an athletic field here. This is Weymouth Landing in the background. And is the church identifiable, do you know, that's up on the hill? But uh, but uh, you try to get oriented to a place like this, and you also see the Liberty Party, and there was a presidential year, and then of course the American flag. So the, the only difference between that and the Hingham event was probably another 6,000 people. <laughs> but the point is that this is just such a special piece. So um, we chose it, the publisher chose it to sort of represent the feeling of the, of the book. It's, all right, so it, it, it's getting to be about the time, looking forward to the 10th anniversary of the freeing of the slaves in the West Indies. And a couple of people worked with 
uh, William Lloyd Garrison to encourage th the, that there should be a great event here in Hingham. And one of them was Reverend Samuel May, who turns out to have been the brother of Abigail May, Abigail May, who married Bronson Alcott. Abigail and Bronson were Louisa May Alcott's parents. Now, the interesting thing was that Samuel May was an abolitionist and was preacher, a rector in a church in South Situate, but because of his politics, he was asked to leave. But he went on to become one of the key abolitionists and eventually ended up in Northern New York. And you can look through his records today. It's an extraordinary um, collection of, of abolitionist documents. But um, at the time, um, he wrote in uh, just before, say, about 1842, we really have to celebrate the emancipation of the British slaves. We have to treat it with great celebration and focus attention on this is, this is what we should be doing here in the United States as well. Um, so I wanted to include him because he was behind the scenes. Uh, there's no record that he was here in Hingham. Um, there, wa there were four events held that very same day of August 1st, 2nd, and I'll tell you about that. One was in Concord, one was here, one was in Boston, one was in New Bedford but he happened to be at the one in Concord and not here that we knew, but was very key in that day. The other person of great note to Hingham was Sidney Howard Gay, who grew up here in town and was a descendant of Ebenezer Gay, one of the great divines who ran the Old Ship Church or the rector of Old Ship Church. And his father was a lawyer, however. Um, he went to law school, but he couldn't pledge allegiance, if you will, to the a constitution because he felt that it didn't allow equality for those who were slave, enslaved. So he went and joined the abolitionists. And about the time of this picnic, he suggested that Tranquility Grove would be a great spot for gathering. He'd grown up around the corner from Tranquility Grove in this house next to the country club. I don't know the number, but it's on South Street. So uh, he was the one that uh, was responsible for the fact that all of the abolitionists gathered coming by boat and coming by coach from all over the South Shore and the Boston and North Shore area. Oh, and to go back to him for a moment, one reason that he's so significant today is that when he was the editor of the National Anti-Savory Standard down in New York, um, he kept a, a meticulous notes of how slaves escaped their bondage who had enslaved them, how they'd been treated, how they got out, and where they eventually ended up. This record um, was discovered about 12 years ago at Columbia University for the first time. And there were two books that were created based on those records of Sidney Howard Gay. And one is by Eric Foner, which is quite a, quite a good book, and the other by an uh, Underground Railroad group in New York. So basically, just, I mean, every day in doing this research, something else came out of the woodwork. Uh, who the people were who organized this, the marshal was a man named Jairus Lincoln, uh, another descent, descended from Hingham originally, and he also wrote a songbook um, uh, that, where the songs were familiar tunes, but poets wrote um, abolitionist lyrics to them. Um, it, they had instructions about where to bring food, where to leave it, the publicity was in advance. Uh, they described, we, f we found a record of banners, and some of them are owned today by the Hingham Historical Society. We found how many people came and from where and how. And not only that, who took care of their horses when they were in the parade or when they were in the grove. We heard about the description of the procession. Uh, we, we have, and have included some letters talked about the luncheon and the speakers and the music. And then we'll uh, talk a little bit later about what happened after the fact. Now, some of the committee members working with Jairus Lincoln, the marshal, uh, were the three uh, Thaxter sisters, uh, Anna, Catherine, and um, Eliza, Elizabeth. And they were cousins of John Quincy Adams. And it was Anna Quincy Thaxter who had approached John Quincy Adams. He had been president and now he was not so well and sitting at home in Peacefield and corresponding and writing in his diary. So they were among the ones who were collecting food for this occasion and they were helped in the process by Lucretia Leonard, 
who was a black um, servant to them, uh, who's a, a, a significant person in Hingham history as well. Uh, she was very well known, and one reason that she became so well known was that uh, before segregation came to an end in Plymouth County, which was about the 1841, uh, there was a segregated balcony in New North Church, and she was the only person to sit up there until Plymouth County Anti-Slavery Society voted against uh, segregation, at which point she was invited down to sit with her employers, the Thaxter sisters. Um, and that just was noteworthy. Some of the parishioners left, but for the most part, it changed the, it changed the, the, the way of, do, of you know, church going. And she survived all the sisters and lived to 1904 and is buried next to them in the Hingham Cemetery. So she was a wonderful individual. So when the procession was held, um, all these people gathered from the counties that were mentioned. They met in Fountain Square, which is where the New North Church is located. And Cynthia has given me a copy of the Lincoln statue. It's right at that, that is the Fountain Square area. And uh, Norfolk, Plymouth County, people came. They left their horses and carriages down in South Hingham and then over in something called North Spain, Old Spain in Weymouth, and I don't know why it's called Old Spain, so maybe you could let me know after. But people walk then here, and there were those to take care of their horses. Now the pastor at um, New North End was Oliver Stearns, who when he arrived was already an abolitionist. So he was a key um, person that day of the big picnic at Tranquility Grove, and they gathered around his church and around um, Fountain Square. Later, he was to become well known because at the time of the Fugitive Slave Act, when the law was passed that people should turn over those who were um, fleeing to, uh, to captors, um, he wrote a very famous sermon against the Fugitive Slave Act, which was published nationally. So he was another Hingham abolitionist who had great national stature. So here is where the procession took place. The New North Church is here, it was then called the Third Congregational Society. All the people from Norfolk and Plymouth counties gathered all around here and formed a procession led by 50, a Legion of Honor, 50 girls wearing white, carrying wreaths of oak leaves. And they all processed down up here North Street and right down to the waterfront to the steamboat wharf. And they split along the way to form a sort of a column through which all of the delegates out of Boston, Suffolk County, Essex County, and Middlesex County, came by the Portland steamboat dis and landed here. And then they processed all the way back, went, took that little short South Street link, came up Main Street, and then they turned at the um, property, let me see, they turned, okay, they turned at the property of the Thaxters, 135, 137, and came up and over the hill and into Tranquility Grove, where they stayed for the remainder of the day till about seven in the evening. And this is sort of a residual pier that the, where the boat would have come in from, they would have boarded at Liverpool Wharf in Boston, went over to East Boston to pick up the folks from the North Shore, including Frederick Douglass, who came down that day and then down to Hingham. And then this was the little South Street uh, connection over to Main Street. And if you are to go by um, 135, 137, you can still see the residual granite columns. There is now a fence across here where the procession turned and went up and then over the hill, um, over what's now Central Street and back into the grove. So these are some of the actual banners that you can see mentioned in the Liberator newspaper. Um, and, and this describes which delegation carried it. And of course, this is a familiar picture from the Day of Liberation um, in 1834. This one was a, a, owned also by the Massachusetts Historical Society, was uh, William Lloyd Garrison's motto. And this was some, his motto that he had when he was um, first starting his newspaper. I am an earnest, I will not equivocate, I will not excuse, I will not 
retreat a single inch and I will be heard. And this, you can tell these were people of strong and passionate opinions. And then this was the Essex County. Shall a republic which could not bear the bonds of a king cradle a bondage which a king has abolished? But what you should also know is that we had a number of banners that were put up in the oak, among the oak trees of Tranquility Grove here in Hingham, and the Hingham Historical Society still owns them. And this is one of them. They're just amazing. And um, they are slaves who fear to speak for the fallen and the weak. And then these various, God made us free, then fetter not a brother's limbs. So these are still um, held in the Historical Society thanks to a woman named Susan Barker Willard, who I'll talk about in a moment. But this one is the one that brings you into the grove itself. Hail, friend of truth, thou enterest here, the grove long named Tranquility. O oh, let thy soul then breathe sweet peace, pure love and true humility. So the day, um, we know about the procession, the description of the procession, and then we know about the speeches and the letters and the poems and the songs because we find them in different places. And one place we can find them is in the pages of John Quincy Adams's journal, which, in which he wrote every day. And here he was writing about uh, the anniversary celebration of the 1st of August and that he had a visit from Thomas Loring, who was a cousin, urging him to come down. And he talked about how he couldn't come because of his health, but that he had written a letter of some prolixity. And um, sure enough, there is a very long and passionate letter about his issues. And he was very active in Congress at the time, fighting a lot of the, um, a lot of the issues of the day. But one of the interesting sidebar notes about what we discovered about John Quincy Adams was that this particular portrait, which is involved, is in the book, is owned by the National Portrait Gallery, was painted by Hingham artist William Hudson, Jr. And it was painted just a month after the abolitionist picnic. And one of the things I thought was most interesting was that they talked about what he should do about his hands. And he, was, he had suffered from rheumatic arthritis. So his hands were obviously disfigured. And you can see what they decided to do. One case, it was wrapped a hand around a spyglass, and his other hand is tucked into his jacket. And this was all described, including his relationship with a painter, in his um, journal. So we talk about uh, that as well. And because there's been a request, I would like to sing this. And if you can figure it out, you can join me. But take a look at the first line, and then take a look at um, the first line, and then take a look at the music, which is in the second line. And we can start at, uh, it's, I am an abolitionist, I glory in the name. I am an abolitionist, I glory in the name. Though now by slavery's minions hissed and covered o'er with shame. It is a spell of light and power, the watchword of the free. Who spurns it in the trial hour, a craven soul is he. Well, there you are. <laughs> it's wonderful. But, but you know, <laughs> but it was amazing because people talk about Colin Kaepernick taking a knee and what would, the, what would John Quincy Adams and others have said? Well, they were far more, um, they were far more challenging to what we considered to be our nation's primary documents because they felt so strongly that uh, these documents, this constitution, these songs, the 4th of July, none of it represented freedom and equality for slaves. So it was a very fraught time and it was fascinating to learn, to learn about it. And, and for me, this little book is only just a beginning. But among the other singers that day, um, and I had mentioned Jairus Lincoln's creating a songbook, um, but were the very famous Hutchinson family singers. They came down from New Hampshire. Now they were like the Peter, Paul, and Mary of their day. Very, very famous. And people would come to hear them because they were so well known. And they came out on the ferry from the North Shore with the others, including Frederick Douglass.
And um, they had also been singing temperance songs, but they, they were now writing abolitionist songs. And uh, so they were featured during the afternoon along with the many speeches that were identified. And the next year, after Frederick Douglass completed his autobiography, they would go to England with him. He was trying to get out of town because his autobiography was fairly controversial, but they all went together and made the lecture tour in Great Britain. So here I mentioned the anti-slavery melodies, and it's a thin book of a lot of songs like I Am an Abolitionist. John Greenleaf Whittier wrote one of them. And here's a relatively new um, portrait of Frederick Douglass owned by the Onondaga Historical Society. But he was perhaps the best, most frequently photographed person of his era. Um, a very compelling um, person from the very moment he made his first um, speech um, and was heard by the abolitionists. But he was here that day and spoke, but there's no record of his word. Another person from Hingham I wanted to include because he did live here, although he was active a bit earlier, was Albert Fearing, who was president of the American Colonization Society. As you see, it was founded earlier. But I, this was, the proposal here was to send free blacks and slaves back to Africa. And needless to say, this was very controversial. There were some, um, there were mixed feelings about it. Uh, but he also was a principal benefactor of this library at the time. And he contributed perhaps $30,000 to this library and then another $30,000 to, to establish a library in the university in uh, Liberia. So um, he was a philanthropist who stood, you know, put his money where his heart was, even though um, uh, most people felt that the slaves, the freed slaves and blacks should be integrated into US society. And, but there were those who, who did make the trip. And this may look familiar to you, but this is where Albert Fearing lived, St. Paul's Rectory. <laughs> yeah, right next to the, Third, you know, Third Congregational Society, New North Church. Now, I wanted to mention uh, Maria Weston Chapman, who I have included in the book because at the last meeting, someone said, well, where were the women? And the women were very much part of every moment of these events. Maria Weston Chapman, in particular, from Weymouth, and one of the great figures of Weymouth, there's a school named for her and a new school being built in her honor. The, picture of Tranquility Grove, that beautiful collage was from the Weston family property. But she, she was educated actually in England and then came back and became active with the um, Garrisonian abolitionists and was one of sort of Garrison's key, key sort of a, more than an amanuensis organizers. Um, but her specialty was organizing anti-slavery fairs where goods would come in from all over the um, Europe and they would uh, sell these goods to raise money either for the Underground Railroad or to help influence Congress. So um, she also had literary books that she would publish and she was a prodigious correspondent. So if you look online for either the Boston Public Library or Massachusetts Historical Society, you can find her writing letters to people in Hingham all over the place. So she was just an extraordinary person and uh, again founded the uh, Female Anti-Slavery Society very early in 1832. Um, so we don't know whether she was here, she wasn't mentioned, she didn't speak, she wasn't among the speakers of the day. Um, Abby um, Foster did speak, but um, in any case, I wanted to include her because she's from this area and she was such an important person in the abolition, abolitionist movement. Um, I just put this uh, in because it was a typical broadside of events of the day. Um, there was another anti-slavery um, event held in Framingham another in about nine years later, and uh, another beautiful grove and accessible by railroad. But this is sort of typical of the broadsides that one would see. So basically, uh, this study that was Alec McMillan had asked about that was supposed to be sort of a review of deeds turned into a look at groves and Tranquility Grove in particular, um, into something that looked at the abolitionists and all people from Hingham and those who came to Hingham who were involved. It looked at the August 1st celebrations, the one here, the one in Boston, um, the one in Concord where 
Ralph Waldo Emerson delivered a huge speech, which is included in the back of this book, very, very significant, outlining the evils of slavery and the work of the British Parliament. Um, so we also uh, found out so much about the preparations in Hingham from the newspapers and uh, different books that were memoirs of the day. We found out about the event and the speakers uh, and the singers. And the aftermath we should talk about from the very beginning, um, Alec was wondering what would have what would have been the plans for the sanitary facilities that day? <laughs> and there's, ne there's not a word to be found anywhere. <laughs> but it continued to be a good question because what happened is that after everybody left at 7.30, 7 o'clock that evening and went back to their boat and went back to their coaches and their carriages, um, the poor Thaxter brothers were so distraught by the condition of the grove that they vowed never to have another gathering there. It was really too bad. And they began to cut down these beautiful trees. And we know that because the Universalist group, which was due to have a picnic there, wrote a very sad little poem acknowledging all of this, but said that they found uh, the top of Baker Hill was equally um, heavenly and poetic. And the other aftermath piece of, that I found particularly interesting, because I've been involved with the ferry boats in the South Shore a long time, um, was that the group that went back to Boston by ferry um, embarked, and the captain happily headed out into Hingham Harbor, but misread the tides and ended up on a sandbar. And the entire Essex County, Middlesex, and Suffolk County delegation were marooned overnight with no facilities and no food. So the story there was that uh, Frederick Douglass was, and a colleague were going around passing resolutions, and Garrison told them to keep their dignity. So it sounded, and they made it back to Boston for breakfast the next morning. None the worse for wear. So the question is, what do we do with all this information and, and uh, what difference does it make? But first, I, I did want to mention Susan Barker Willard. Um, Susan Barker Willard was a, a Thaxter descendant and lived in a cottage on the property. And when she passed away, she left everything in her collection, all these historic artifacts, including all of the banners from uh, Tranquility Grove um, to the Historical Society, which is why we have those banners today. It's just remarkable. Um, and m many of her materials are maybe familiar because they're over in the old ordinary now. So she was um, a key figure in establishing the uh, Historical Society. And at one point, her cottage was on Main Street, and then it was moved up between Main Street and Central, and now uh, it belongs to the Masella family. Um, it's uh, up and off of Central. So, okay, so what do we do next? Um, it would be good somehow to bring that property back to a place that could be visited. If you go in now, it's, as you saw from the very beginning, it's pretty much overgrown with brush. And um, there's an Eagle Scout that's going to take on the entrance to try to fix up the entrance. But uh, could it be more? Could it be a place where uh, we have some interpretive material about the events of that particular period? And there's nothing else like that in Hingham right now. There are examples that we can look to. And one of them is here in Florence, Massachusetts, where there's a beautiful park to Sojourner Truth. And then, um, a walkway that visits all of the various homes of freed slaves, uh, cooperatives that existed, and um, other. This is immediately adjacent to Northampton. So there's a case where a community has worked the history um, right into the community itself. And we do have our walking trail for the processions and the people in Hingham who were involved with this period. So it's something we could think about and look at as well. Um, Tony Morrison has established a program called The Bench by the Side of the Road, which he's using. There are about, uh, maybe about 13 or 14 that have been erected so far. And her foundation will place them in places that were significant to the Freedom Trail, the Underground Railway, or the abolitionist period. So this happens to be a bench um, up in Concord um, honoring Caesar Robbins, who was involved with the Underground Railroad. And then a more recent uh, one that's been underway for quite a while is uh, the Abolitionist Row Park, where the, uh, New Bedford is committed to establishing a park 
Uh, there were about 17 abolitionist homes in this area. And of course, that was where Frederick Douglass had escaped to first. Um, so that's going on now. So finally, um, uh, last spring, we took a group of uh, Lonnie uh, Fournier, the, the Conservation Commission, the Historical Commission, uh, and then Mark Duff, our former fire chief, and Jerry, and went up to visit uh, the Tranquility Grove and took a look around. And there is open space, but as you can see, there's a lot of overgrown material too. So now the whole eventual, uh, the property is in the hands of the town and hopefully of those who might like to see something happen there as well. So it's lovely to have Jared Mayo coming up as an Eagle Scout candidate mm -hmm. to do some work at the beginning and perhaps we can find some more um, who would like to be involved as well. And then the, this is the privilege of the author, excuse me, mm -hmm. but it was so exciting to have this historical report to the uh, commission um, become of such great interest that it became a book. And as somebody who has been involved with the ferries and since their beginning in 1975, it was particularly exciting to me to hear that the book was in a container coming on a big green ship <laughs> for, for, from the United Kingdom. And sure enough, it did. And you can follow it on marinetraffic.com. So I knew when it arrived and it came into New York and then off the books went by, tr by truck. But anyway, I just thought this was a pretty exciting picture. So I just want to say thank you so much uh, to the Hingham Library and Alec uh, and uh, Buttonwood Books, Gwendolyn, and the Historical Society in Alec Macmillan, and to all of those who'd been involved and to those who provided the photographs. And I hope if, if you have any questions, please ask. And otherwise, I'm so glad you came. Thank you so much. Oh, We had heard it was about 70 before the 1783. And as I mentioned, there's a, a young woman who's written a book about the slaves in Situate and Norwell. And that book has recently come out and I don't know it, but if, does any of you, have any of you run into her book at all? But there is a, there is a current book and it's a whole story that needs, uh, needs to and can be told. It, it, by the way, it is mentioned that Lucretia Leonard was a slave, but she was born after the, the Quack Walker case, so I don't think that was that was true. I think that her life was as a black servant, um, wherever she might have been. That's a very good question, whether any language might have come through the doc from one document to another. I have no idea about that, but that's a wonderful question. Um, uh, that would be a whole, that, and by the way, that's one thing that I feel about this book is that it's just a starting point. I mean, every single person in here, let, I'll give you one quick example, Born Spooner. Born Spooner is a man from Plymouth who founded the Plymouth Cordage Company, a huge company at stay. But he had learned the trade in New Orleans and he was so horrified about what he saw of slavery that he came back and he structured his whole company for better labor practices. And then he headed up the Anti-Slavery Society. But he, he is, you know, is one of these people you say, oh my goodness, this man it really deserves a book himself and, and so many of the others do as well. But I think that's a good question. Well, the main thing was how exciting it was to find out this rich, deep history and these people, I just had never known about any of these people before and how passionate they were and how they were taking on banks, they were taking on churches, they were taking on the entire establishment. And um, it's an era that's, uh, uh, but it was a minority of people in the town. That's the other interesting thing too. Um, in fact, Jairus Lincoln, who was the marshal, I think was not comfortable here and left Hingham a year later. Um, and so there, and, and in fact, the Hingham Journal of Record, the Hingham Patriot never showed up at this event and whined that nobody had given them any information. But then the week after, um, somebody had sent an anonymous um, article. So there were obviously very strong feelings in many different directions. So I sort of see this as a beginning stage where you could take almost any one of these people, Callistus Burley, who wouldn't cut his hair until slavery was ended. His hair was very long at the time. <laughs> 
but people like that who lived in Lynn and North Shore and Salem. And um, I, it's a good starting point for that period of history. Yes, you know, if that's inter it's a very good question. And I never found any concern expressed, uh, articulated. Um, in fact, what was interesting is that the uh, various accounts after the fact observe that the entire town of Hingham was decorated up with um, ribbons and bows and the bells rang morning, noon, and night. So it could be that it was Jarvis Lincoln the Marshal was also a selectman. That might have had something to do with it. But um, I think that the, Hingham, the fact that the Hingham Patriot didn't show up to an event that was obviously so huge was an indication of a bit of a sniffiness on their part. Uh, and I had heard that Frederick Douglass had been here two years before at the Baptist Church, which uh, was very active in abolitionist matters at the time. And he apparently made a talk against new, uh, pointing out that Old Chip was collaborating with the, the banks and you know, s slavery. So there were issues, but um, it wasn't at all evident in any of the language of that day. But great question. Uh, no, actually, what was going on for him then was that he was on that circuit. So I think he had 100 lectures to give. He was everywhere, everywhere. And he was visiting every single in uh, town and, and uh, location. But what I did include in this book were two excerpts of his speeches. One that dis said, what to us is the 4th of July, mm -hmm. which is very, raises some very interesting questions. What does it mean for us? We are not, we don't have the advantages of the protection of the Constitution. And the other one was a speech that he gave um, some years later, I think when he was in Rochester, which is where he's buried. And that one, uh, uh, is an excerpt of a speech he gave for another one of the August 1st commemorations. Mm -hmm. So I picked up those elements from that. And of course, there's a wonderful new biography that's out now that gives a very comprehensive view of his life. He was a remarkable, remarkable human being. Yeah. So. Probably very few. Um, there are a number of pictures in here of those who were leaders who were who are here, um, and there were maybe a dozen or so who were among the speakers that day who had come in from Philadelphia, the North Shore. But um, if you saw the picture of the event in Weymouth, and you take a close look, you can see that maybe about I'd say not a third, but uh, maybe an eighth of the people who were attending that particular event were black, and everybody was dressed in their sun, absolute Sunday best. And one of the things that the abolitionists tried to do was to convey a sense of dignity and decorum so that they wouldn't be subject to criticism. But I think if you can take, there was no record of there was this many of this and this many of that. Um, but I think from that, you can see that there was a participation. Um, and then there were also um, the Native American population, and I'm just not sure what that, whether there was representation. I, Lucretia Leonard was from a Wampanoag background as well. So that's another story, but it's a good question. And in fact, by the way, that's one of the issues today when people talk about abolitionists, a complaint among black scholars is that um, it's the black story that's been sort of taken over by the white abolitionists. So there are those issues as well. Thank you so much, really, for just delighted you came. Yeah.